So, <clears throat> I've been speaking on the topic of loneliness in four broad parts. I'll use an acronym CARE, C A R E, to explain this. You don't like it. Okay. Uh, do we have a projector? Yes. Or, it's okay, no problem. I'll just speak without it. Okay. So, basically, there are two kinds of loneliness. One is when we are physically alone and the second is when we are emotionally alone. Now physically alone can sometimes even be an advantage. Sometimes we want solitude. I want to, I want to think. I want to be with myself. So there is a difference between being alone and being lonely. Lonely is more an emotional state than a physical state. And emotional loneliness comes when we, f we don't emotion connect at the level of emotions with others. So it can also happen when we are all alone, but it can happen even more when we are surrounded by people, but those people don't understand us. When we feel completely ununderstood at that time, there's a very deep feeling of loneliness that can come. So, in fact, I was in UK and UK government has actually appointed a minister for loneliness. That a minister for loneliness is when people feel lonely, how do we deal with that? It's a huge problem, all the more so because the traditional social structures that people had are falling apart. So traditional social structures means earlier there's joint families or at least nuclear families. Now the nuclear family is also broken apart and we all have just neutrons and protons orbiting around. It's very unfortunate. So you can just scan that page. Uh, let's take a scanned photo of that page. No, there's no scan. I can draw. No, no, with a photo. Just okay. The, the phone is scanned. Okay. okay. And you can project it. Okay. Mm -hmm. If possible. So, I'll talk about, as I said, I'll talk about this in four parts. C is courage. So, the courage to trust. What does that mean, courage to trust? That actually forming any relationship involves a matter of risk. And there can be two extremes. One is that one is naive. Naive and everybody, we think that everybody is a good person. Everybody is trustworthy. And if somebody is naive, they, they will be brought down, smashed down to the earth. The people will be betrayed and betrayal can, in various ways, it can scar people lifelong. So if you could, if you draw a spectrum like that, we'll hopefully have this illustration here, that one extreme could be naivety, where we think that everybody is wonderful and nothing works out. And the other extreme is cynicism. Cynicism is where we think everyone is terrible and nobody is trustworthy. And even if somebody tries to, if somebody is nice to us, we are always thinking, if somebody speaks nicely with us, what does this person want from me? So, even to people's good actions, we ascribed, we ascribed the darkest motivations. So there's a existentialist philosopher who was an atheist. He was asked, "Do you believe in Do you believe in hell?" Now most the question are thought obviously not. How would he believe in hell? If he doesn't believe in God, how will he believe in hell? He says, "Of course I believe in hell." He says, "What is hell?" He says, "Hell means other people." <laughs> that was his idea. That people are so terrible that people are hell. Uh, this is a very, uh, very dangerous view. Dangerous for oneself is dangerous for others. 
Now, if you consider a, spe a spectrum, one extreme is naivety, the other extreme is what is it? Cynicism. Cynicism. Now, in between is courage. Courage means what? In this context, that we all understand that there are snakes inside every one of us. Snakes means selfish desires, uh, horrible urges. So it's there within every one of us. So, but there are snakes inside me, there are snakes inside you, there are snakes inside every one of us. No, we can't see each other's thoughts. And that's a great blessing. If you're able to see everybody's each thought, desire, we would not be able to have a single relationship ever. Because at the level of the mind, you, you think like this about me? You have this kind of desire? You are like that? It would be horrible, it would be unbearable. So therefore, uh, the in between, we all have been given by nature a buffer. Certain terrible desires may come up within us, but we can prevent those desires from being expressed as actions. So in that sense, there is the buffer which helps us to protect ourselves, to guard ourselves. So knowing that others have snakes inside them, I have snakes inside me, but Despite that, there is also good inside you and I am ready to trust. So, actually forming any relationship is an act of courage. It, it can be an act of naivety and we can approach it with cynicism. But both these extremes, naivety will lead us to being hurt by people who betray us. Cynicism will lead us to being hurt by being by being completely lonely, completely heartless. And most of us, we oscillate between these two. We are naive and people take us for a ride and then we just go to the other extreme. Then we close the doors of our heart and we just stay completely isolated. Can you just show me that sheet? I'll just show it from there. You're projecting it? Okay. Thank you. So, uh, so, 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 it requires courage. So, in a sense, loneliness, it's a choice that results. We may not even think I am choosing to be lonely. But loneliness results when we, because of bad experiences of naivety, go towards cynicism. And when you go towards cynicism, often we think that I will go through life all alone. I don't need anyone. And we might make a virtue out of our cynicism. People are not as trustworthy. I can be alone. I don't care for anyone. But it's, it's something which deprives us. So just as naivety can hurt us, cynicism can also hurt us. So loneliness, now everybody can, can have gone through different situations. Some people may be born to unloving parents. Some people might have had bullies in their schools. Or some people might have had um, very bad life partners or whatever. So, we all can withdraw into a shell because of that. And when we withdraw into a shell, then that only increases our loneliness. Now, there is reason, no doubt. Each of us may have a reason by which if I don't want to connect with anyone. Because people will betray me, people will hurt me. But not connecting will also hurt us. Because just as, just as connecting with people, opening ourselves can hurt us, loneliness can also hurt us. So first of all, to come out of loneliness, we need to have the courage to trust. And we need to see itself as an act of courage. Now every relationship that we form, it's, it's, it requires courage to form that. If that courage is not there, it's actually it's very easy not easy in an emotional sense, but easy in an egoistic sense to go it alone. Yeah, I don't care for anyone else. But that leaves us feeling very lonely. So I was said, what was the acronym I was going to talk about? Care. Care. Okay. 
So C is the courage to trust. So any questions or comments about this till now? Anything that struck you, any, any point you've till now felt you would like to carry home? Any some reflection? Cynicism. Yeah. So that, that's an interesting point, you know, because generally, as you said, we tend to be either naive or very cynical. Hmm. So, but I like the fact that there is a spectrum in which it's also classified. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So if a naive person is getting, repeatedly getting bad experiences because of his naive belief, how does he gather courage? Because he is repeatedly. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, if a naive person has repeatedly been uh, been hurt, then how does a naive person develop courage? Yeah, that's why I said courage is something which is different from foolhardiness. See, if we have had some sickness and we took some medicine and that we went to some doctor and that medicine backfired and made things worse then we have to use our intelligence. We need to evaluate. Is this worthwhile? Generally, trusting has two aspects to it. It has to be sensible and verifiable. That means, now if somebody has a long track record of having uh, betrayed others, and then I choose to trust them, then obviously I am being foolish. But if whatever I can ascertain about the other person, they seem to be good people, then it has to be step by step. It's like say, if there's a stranger at our house, we won't open the door immediately. Maybe we will look out, maybe ask some questions, and then gradually we will just open the chain and talk with them a little bit. And then we might invite them in our house. So it's incremental. So, okay, when, when we find that we were let down, we were betrayed, so what can I learn from it? Okay, that maybe I rush too fast into things. Well, let me go slow. So, naivety is, it's, it's, um, it's something similar if we can consider relationships to be like an emotional investment. Mm -hmm. Then we have emotions. So, just as if we have money. Now, if we invest in some, some harebrained scheme and we lose money, then what do we do if you say? We learn. Okay. You know, let me try to, that life doesn't come ever with a guarantee that our decisions will be right. But we all, by experience, learn at least some things about how we can make reasonable decisions. So same way, this is the idea, I will come to this point again of emotions as an investment. Our emotions are like the capital that we have, we are invested in a relationship. Now where do I invest it, that is something which I have to, I have to be careful about it. So we learn, just as we will be careful investing money, we can be careful investing emotions. But just as we need to invest if we want the money to grow, similarly we need to whatever emotions we had, so only when we invest in the reciprocation, then the emotions deepen and grow. Thank you. Yes? Yeah, how we try, it can be, we can try more cautiously. Definitely we should be cautious. And it's, if some relationship has gone sore, it's best not to immediately rush into another relationship. Because that time, we might be rushing into the next relationship more for relief from the wound of the previous relationship, rather than considering the healthiness of this relationship in itself. So maybe we need some time to, say if we are, it's like, okay, if you take an example of walking. See, if I walk and the floor was slippery and I had a bad fall. Now, next time when I walk in that same area, I'll be cautious. But if I say, I'm so afraid I won't walk, it's not good. I won't be able to move only. But again, I walk recklessly, then also I'm going to be hurt. So definitely caution is required. And one way of being cautious is going slow. Okay. Thank you. Yes, please. Okay, yeah. So courage is different from foolhardiness. It's measurable, it's incremental, and you can also diminish. Uh, and then trust is your emotional investment, relief versus healthiness of self and others. But what 
for trust? Okay, I have said it. In trust, for it should be re sensible and verifiable. For it to be verifiable. reasonable, verifiable. That means, okay, it makes sense. Okay, this person seems to be whatever I learned about them. It seems to be it seems a good person. And when, now this is if I hear that person is very warm and caring, and then when I talk with them, they are very harsh. There's something wrong over here. So it's not verifiable. So we hear something about someone, and then in our interaction they are similar. So it's sensible and verifiable. So things match out. So if we don't check at all, they are not being sensible. Hmm? But if uh, what we hear, we check it out, and then we experience it ourselves, then then it's very good. It's basically again like medication. We first of all we won't go to a say a cobbler on the street to ask her. No, I am sick, what medicine should I take? We will go to a person who has a reasonably good track record as a doctor. That is sensible. And then if they say, take this medication, and in three days you will feel better. Thus do I feel better? If I do not, then maybe I have to check what is happening. So, sensible and verifiable. Okay. Thank you. So, so, now, basically, when we have to put this courage on others, at that, so the A which I am going to talk about is acceptance. Now, acceptance means that we have to accept our mistakes and we have to accept ourselves with our mistakes. There are again, again with respect to see, whenever a relationship is not working out, the other person may have an issue, but we may also have an issue. So, with respect to ourselves. Can you just zoom it out? Or you can just, it won't zoom out? Hmm. So, acceptance means, the, uh, one is, like some people, they have certain issues, but they just don't accept it. Like I was at a, at a place where, one of the persons who was in the, I was I travel across the world. So one of the persons who was a leader over there. Everybody was telling that this person is very short tempered, very angry, and yeah, the anger issues. They need to manage their anger. So when I talk with that person, he said that you know I don't have any anger issues. People just need to stop making me angry. <laughs> 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 so, what is happening? They are not accepting that I have some difficult, I have some limitations. So, I have some things which I need to work on. So, it, it, this courage to trust, I am taking this point forward, acceptance means I have to accept my mistakes. So maybe I, I, I was too naive over there, maybe I am too judgmental, maybe I am too domineering, whatever it is. So, we have to accept our, accept our mistakes. So if we live, if we are too proud, we are too arrogant, then we think always the fault is with the other person. Like some people say, I could agree with you, but then both of us would be wrong. <laughs> so there is such arrogance over there, I could agree with you, but then both of us would be wrong. That means I already judged and decided that you are wrong, so why should I agree with you? So is this, are you opening it? Okay. Mm. So then, but the other extreme could be, one is arrogance, but the, I said accept our mistakes, but we also need to accept ourselves with our mistakes. Some people, when you told, tell them that this is a problem, this is a problem, they start thinking, I am worthless, I am useless, I am hopeless. Then they start beating themselves up. Now, anytime a relationship doesn't go wrong, at least somewhere within us we get a doubt. Oh, maybe something is wrong with me. Maybe something is seriously wrong with me. Now it's uh, it's it's distressing to feel unloved, but it's devastating to feel unlovable. That there is something so intrinsically wrong with me that nobody ever will love me. So we need to accept ourselves with our mistakes. Yes, I have my mistakes, I have my limitations, I have my deficiencies. But self-acceptance is essential. And if, if we don't accept ourselves, how can we expect others to accept us? 
So okay, I have I have issues, and I'm working on my issues. But each one of us has intrinsic self worth. Intrinsic self worth means, irrespective of whatever actions we may have done, uh, we have self worth, which is just by the by virtue of our being conscious beings. Spiritual wisdom traditions tell us that we are all parts of the divine. And just by being parts of divine, just by being uh, that way, sparks of the divine, we have intrinsic self-worth. I was uh, in Australia, in Adelaide, I was giving a seminar on parenting. So at that time I was talking about you know, what is healthy self-esteem. So I was telling that pa if parents appreciate their children for their achievements, and parents appreciate the children for their commitment. Say a child for an exam, every day they study diligently. One, one hour, two hours every day, that's a commitment. Now, if, if the parents appreciate the children for what they achieve, oh, you came first in your class, oh, you got this much CGP. Then what happens, the ch parents, children start thinking that I need to earn my parents' love and I will get that love when I do this. And if I don't do this, then I am not worth being loved. But only if we have this understanding, if somebody is appreciated for their efforts and their efforts are in their hands. So then what happens? Yes, you are an individual and you are making your efforts and I appreciate you for that. So that appreciation for efforts creates intrinsic self-worth. Appreciation for results leads to an extrinsic self-worth. Okay, when I get this, then I'm worthy. So for many people in adulthood, it is their net worth becomes their self-worth. If I'm earning this much, oh, then I'm respectable. If I'm earning only this much, I feel I'm not worthy. So basically, we have to accept ourselves. And now, how do we accept ourselves? This is where spiritual wisdom plays a big role. It explains that we are all, the Bhagavad Gita tells us we are all parts of the divine. And God loves us as we are. Of course, he wants us to become better. But however we are, he loves us. And he values us. That's by his grace that we exist. So we have intrinsic self-worth. Yes, we have issues to work on. So both extremes, denying our mistakes, as well as burying, our, burying ourselves because of our mistakes. You know, I'm, I have so many mistakes, so many deficiencies, I'm useless. So acceptance. Accept our mistakes and accept ourselves with our mistakes. When we do that, then we have a healthy foundation on which to build relationships. If, if, there is no, if there is no acceptance of our mistakes or there is no acceptance of ourselves, then it's like the ground itself is shaky. Quakes can occur any time. And whatever you build on that shaky ground, it can fall at any moment. So spiritual knowledge, spiritual understanding, spiritual growth can help us develop self-acceptance. And by that acceptance, we will be able to move forward. So there is, there are defects within us which may alienate people from us, which may aggravate existing issues in our relationships. But the basic acceptance is that beyond whatever mistakes I may have, there is core self-worth to me. That you know, sometimes you feel if only I had been like this person, then I could have formed. If this person is so much loved by everyone. If only I had been like this person, then I could have found so many relationships. But no, if God had wanted us to be someone else, He would have made someone else. He has made you, you, and He has made you, me. So of course we want to become, you can become a better you, and I can become a better me. But we don't have to reject ourselves. So that is acceptance. So let's look at this. Is this visible to all of you? Yes. Behind? Okay. So basically, I'll just explain what I, where we are and then we can discuss. So basically, I'm talking about four aspects in the relationships. Two with respect to others, that's in between. One with respect to ourselves. 
and then one with respect to the divine, with respect to Krishna. So C A R E. So C is the courage to trust. A is the acceptance. Mm -hmm. And I'll come to R and then E. So now I am talking about A. Ex we need unless we have accepted ourselves and we have accepted our mistakes, we don't have the healthy foundation. So whenever that's why earlier and I said that if we had a bad experience in a relationship, we needn't rush into another relationship. Why? Because that's the time to do some homework. You know, I need to have, I need to learn, okay, what did I do wrong? What do I tend to do wrong? And I also need to have that, okay, despite these wrong things, there is core self-worth to me. When we have these two, then we can move forward in a healthier way to exploring something else. To explore, to moving forward in our existing relationships again or in a new relationship, whatever it is. So, loneliness is caused not just because we can't get along with people. Now, it's even worse if we can't get along with ourselves. Self-loathing is a big problem for many people. I just, now I just dislike myself. Well, yeah, there are things about each one of us which are not likable. But we are our only resource. If we dislike ourselves, who do we have then? If say I have a car which is very old and doesn't work very well, but if that is the only car I have, well, I have to make do with that car. Maybe I can fix that car. But right now, if my car goes very slowly, makes a lot of noise, guzzles a lot of fuel, and then I get angry and I take a iron bar and smash that car, then I'll be left with nothing. So we are our only resource. And accepting ourselves is the foundation on which we can accept relationship with others. So, any comments or questions about this till now? Yeah? So, just as there is a spectrum in courage, one side you mentioned is I'm worthless. It's devastating to feel unlovable, self loathing. This is yeah. going to help. What is the other extreme? You know, if you arrogance. Say, arrogance. Arrogance. So arrogance. Everyone yeah, accept, let's say, I said one, accepting ourselves with our, mis accepting our mistakes and accepting ourselves with our mistakes. So the one is not, one extreme is not accepting ourselves, the other extreme is not accepting our mistakes at all. That's what I said in the beginning. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, we humans have mind. So in order to accept our shortfalls, does mind play any role? Oh, of course. Does the mind play any role in accepting our shortfalls? Like open-minded person versus closed-minded person. Yes. You know, that our mind actually is a major factor in us having certain limitations, shortcomings. The mind is where our emotions, our impulses, our passions, our desires are stored. And from there they pop up. So for us, uh, it's important that when we say self-acceptance, what it means is that this is, I can give the example of a car. So for the soul, we are souls and for the soul, we are spiritual beings. For the soul, the body and mind are like a machine. They are like a vehicle. So say if we are going on to a new place and then we have hired a car over there and we wanted a particular car but we got a different car. They didn't have that car. So when we start driving, first we test it out, you know, okay, where, where, where is this gear, how does this car work, where is this button and how, how fast does it pick up, how does it turn around. So before we can drive a car, we need to learn about the car. How does this car work? What does it do? What does it not do? What does it do well? What does it do poorly? So like that, same way we need to learn about ourselves. Okay, what, what do I do well? What, what does my mind get very easily? What does my mind not get at all? So that kind of learning about ourselves is very important. And self-acceptance means that, okay, I have this kind of mind and this has its limitations, but I as a soul am separate from that. So to deny that we have a mind with its various issues, that is one extreme. And to deny that we are, we have some core strength and goodness independent of our mind's 
a lower nature. That is the other extreme. So we want to balance between the two. So accepting ourselves enables us to accepting ourselves and accepting our mistakes. That creates a foundation by which we can move on. Thank you. Yes. So once you accept, 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 then how do you learn and not to happen there again? Okay, that's a good question. How after we accept ourselves, how do we learn that that doesn't happen again? See, basically, we could say self-realization or living, you could say self-realization might seem a big word, just living with ourselves has two aspects. There is self-discovery and there is self-discipline. So, you could say that we need to look at ourselves like someone whom we want to know. Say, what do you mean I want to know? Say, I know myself. No, we don't really know ourselves. How many times it happens that we speak something, why did I say that? I didn't want to say that. So, some people speak to express their thoughts and some people speak to discover their thoughts. I, I didn't mean to say that, <laughs> it was a slip of tongue. So, we often see and do things which we didn't intend to do. So, we are, it's, we are complicated beings. And if, if say you are working with a new colleague or a new boss, you need to observe them to try to understand how does this person work? What is the nature of this person? So like that, try to observe yourself. And there are some aspects of us which you just need to understand, okay, this is how this person is. So that's self-discovery. And there are some aspects which you need to change, that is self-discipline. So if we go too much towards either in self-acceptance, self-discovery means, okay, this is how I am, accept myself. But accepting ourselves doesn't mean this is how I am, this is how I will stay on. There is some aspect where we have to discipline ourselves. So, generally to change ourselves, it is best to start with one or two or three things. I remember I was giving a talk on New Year resolutions and then there were some um, youth who were talking. So, there one, one boy came and said, I have made 65 New Year resolutions. I said, that is not a resolution, that is a wish list. <laughs> You cannot work on 65 things. Just make it one, two, three. At one time to work more than to work on more than three things is almost impossible. You could decide that okay, there are these six things I need to or ten things I need to work on. But maybe I'll decide for this one month I'll work on this, next month I'll work on this, next month I can work on that. So we need to have some sense of manageability. There are so many things which we can improve on, but if you just focus on oh, trying to improve it all, we'll get overwhelmed. I will not do it at all. So reduce it down to simple, okay. One, two, these are the things I will work on. Okay. Thank you. So now, we talked about, we are going in a circle over here. We start with others, I need, have, need to have the courage to trust. But then, in, in forming a relationship, I need to accept myself. Then we move up again towards others. And in others, here what I am talk about is a reference frame. We are going through the acronym CARE, C-A-R-E. So reference frame means what? That every one of us has our own frame of reference of how we look at things. And based on that, we perceive the world. So I will give some uh, functional examples. First, then I will give relational examples after that. Say right now, when you are sitting, say if the light goes off, say if that particular light is there, that goes off. Fan went off. Fan went off? Okay. So now if the, the fan goes off, then, <laughs> good one. So then we could say, oh, did somebody accidentally turn off that switch? Where is the switch? Maybe somebody leaned on it or somebody touched their hand. So we could say one frame of reference is that okay this went off because somebody pressed the switch. But then you say that okay there is nobody near the switch and you could say oh has that fan got spoiled or you could say that oh, have all the fans turned off, has the power itself in this area been disconnected, uh, has a, or you might call a, call a neighbor and say oh is it in my house or is it everywhere power has gone. Or you could say that, is it that there is a, 
terrorists have attacked america and the power plants have been destroyed and all of america is now powerless or it could be that a solar flare has come from the sun to the earth and if a solar flare enters into the earth's atmosphere scientists have said that all electrical and electronic items on the earth will stop working there's a very remote possibility of that but in 2016 a solar flare came very close to canada and for a few minutes all devices stop working now you could say this is absurd but it's possible so the point i'm making here is that when the simple event the fan going off you could just okay has somebody has pressed the switch or has a solar flare entered into the atmosphere of the earth we could place it in different frames of reference now which is right which is wrong it's not a matter of so much as right and wrong it is more of which is effective which is constructive now it now all of these explanations could work i could say that we somebody switch off the power that's also possible and the solar flare that entered that that's also possible so we normally learn to put things in the right frame of reference sometimes i'm giving a class and the audience looks as if they are watching a foreign language movie without subtitles <laughs> <laughs> now when that starts happening now i could put it in different frame of reference maybe i could say that maybe the audience is very new and i need to speak much more simply or i could put it you know i am such a useless speaker that nobody that nobody cares for what i speak or i could say that i have come here to speak the spiritual stuff nobody is interested in the spiritual stuff the spiritual stuff is useless so you see the same incident i have put it in three different frames of reference one is the audience centric oh the audience must be very new the other could be the speaker centric oh as a speaker i am useless the third is subject centric oh the subject is difficult for people to understand so what happens is every incident every action every interaction we can put it in different frames of reference and all of us based on our experiences we put things in a particular frame of reference but others may not put in that frame of reference most often when misunderstandings happen when we see that okay i am feeling alone we are not emotionally connecting with each other what is happening is two people are coming there with two different frames of reference say now i've seen this happen so many times in relationships that say uh you know uh, say a husband and the wife are supposed to go out somewhere and the wife is waiting to get ready to go out and the husband doesn't come on time and then when that happens now it's just okay she's he's late by 15 minutes half an hour or whatever and then the husband says you know actually i was caught in work and it was very urgent thing i couldn't come now the wife says you never care for me the husband may say actually it's because i care for you that's why i'm working so hard do you think i enjoy working overtime in office no you do it because you get you get prestige and you get fame and you get position and you always neglect me he says and the husband says that no matter how much i do you always keep complaining and then you know both of them start having like a world war 3 <laughs> what happened it's just from the beginning it was a different scale frame of reference so the husband is saying i have got this job and i had this i had this deadline and my boss told me that i have to do this see this is how i am showing my responsibility i could just neglect this but then that will affect my career that may affect my job security i have to do this and the wife feels if you don't come here that means you don't you don't value me you don't value the word that you give to me so what is happening is 
that both of them may be caring for each other but their frames of reference are so different that their care doesn't come through say a father might get for his son uh, a most expensive say baseball bat baseball equipments and a father say i i i love you so much you know, I, i spent so much money and got this best bat and best ball and now the son may just want dad you please play with me now the dad says actually i don't have any time now the father may have a lot of love in the heart for the child and because of that love only that the father is getting expensive toys but what happens the child may not may not want a expensive bat the child just wants play with me so for the father the love is being expressed by getting expensive things for the child the love is felt by by how much time my father is spending how much is my father playing with me so what happens both of them are coming from two different frames of reference and both of the it's all, our frame of reference is almost like our language or our currency imagine two people are talking with each other but they are talking in two different languages nobody understands the other person so we sometimes say they are talking past each other what does that mean they just not address each other's issues so all of us have certain currencies in which we trade this is another example i'm giving for frame of reference say i i come from india and say i buy something from you and it's ex- you, it's an expensive item which you have given me now and then i pay you in indian in inr in indian currency rupees now you have never seen inr and that's of no use to you and i give you a good amount for that and you feel you taken this product you given me nothing in return i say i have given you so much how much are you going to demand you are being so exploitative so what is happening is the two people are trading in different currencies and if the trade is in different currencies and there is no conversion then the trade falls apart so similarly if we find that we are we we are uh, that we are feeling alienated in a particular relationship where we want to work on that relationship but somehow we are feeling alienated then that could be not because the other person is bad or we are bad can you stop it so so why why is it so if the two people are trading in different currencies then nothing works then both people might be investing a lot but people don't feel connected so we have to understand what frame of reference is this person coming from have you felt sometimes when you interact with someone why do you why does this person think like this why do you think like this has any of you felt like that we all have felt you know hey, i never meant that why do you think like that but that's because they are coming from that frame of reference and now all of us can adjust the frame of reference but we need to begin this like currency conversion is possible but at least we understand okay this person not cheating me that i have given them so much and they are giving me nothing in return they are giving it but in a different currency so how do we understand what is the other person's currency see for forming any relationship with anyone understanding their frame of reference or understanding their currency which currency are they trading in that is extremely important and how do we understand that broadly there are two ways one is that what is it that if we do they appreciate it very much they tell everyone oh you know this person did this for me they are so grateful they are so happy oh you did this for me what is it if we do they appreciate it very much and the opposite side what is it if we don't do they can't stop complaining about it 
How could you not hold this? How could you forget this? How could you do that? So I was in Washington DC, I was giving a seminar on sensitive speech and after that one Indian gentleman asked a question. Sometimes when people ask questions itself, it's polarizing question. So he says, is it that women have a very long memory? He said that something which I did in 1975, my wife is still complaining about it. <laughs> so, I told him that, you know, can't they forget it? First I said, I have forgotten the answer to this. <laughs> so, then I said, actually speaking, you know, if somebody is remembering that, that just means that that is so important for them. Rather than saying, it's such a small thing, why are you dragging it up now? If they are dragging it up, that means it's not a small thing for them. In their currency, that was a big withdrawal, that was a big loss. So sometimes you may tell people, keep small things small. And it's true, we all need to keep small things small. Like, one of my friends is a marriage counsellor. And he was telling me that sometimes people come for separation. And they say, they say irreconcilable differences. Okay. And he asked, there's a woman who had come to him, he says, a irreconcilable difference with my husband. So he said, what is the difference? He said that you know, he drove in, in my car without taking my permission. I said, okay, but is that an irreconcilable difference? Yes. He says, he doesn't respect me, he doesn't respect my position, he doesn't respect my freedom. How can I live with such a person? Is that something to get separated? Now, of course, you should, maybe you shouldn't drive with somebody else's car. That's true. But is that worth getting separated about? Now, if that person is taking it so seriously, now either you could say it's a small thing that they're taking it too big, but it could be that that person just wants to feel respected. And they repeatedly felt disrespected. And they see this as an indicator that you don't respect me. You don't value me. You don't care for my opinion. You just ride over me. So basically, we all need to learn to keep small things small. But if somebody is making a small thing big, then we have to understand that it is a big thing for them. We can't just keep telling them, why are you making a small thing big? We have to understand that in their currency, this is a big thing. So we might try to understand, okay, instead of saying it's a small thing, and instead of just saying, you know, okay, this person makes a big thing about it, you say, okay, can you explain why this is so important for you? See, this is a very non-judgmental question. We can, be, we can either be judgmental in saying you make a small thing big, or we can just be judgmental in another way, you know, you are just like this. But one way to understand, can you explain to me why this is so important for you? I can see that this has affected you a lot, that this matters a lot to you. No, it wouldn't have mattered to me. I want to understand why it matters so much to you. Then what happens? We, ex we our frame of reference expands because you start seeing from their perspective. So one way to connect with others is to understand their frame of reference. And that's why when people become, as I said, emotional extremes, they appreciate a lot or they complain a lot. Instead of taking it so too personally, so taking it too personally, try to see from their perspective. See, inside every complaining adult, inside every complaining adult is a crying infant. Inside every complaining adult is a crying infant. That infant is crying for attention, that infant is crying for understanding, that infant is crying for affection. So now, what happens, is, say, if, if there's a mother and a small baby, and a mother picks up the baby and the baby kicks the mother. The kick hurts, but the mother doesn't kick the kick personally. Maybe the baby is in pain, the baby is hungry, and the baby doesn't even know what I'm doing. The baby has no intention to kick the mother. The baby is just in pain so much. So now, now if an adult kicks like that, that would be outrageous. But the fact is that, 
everybody has an infant inside them. It's a crying infant. So when others speak or do something to us, quite often it is not about us. Although it is targeted to us. So if we can just keep a little distance, don't take others' actions so personally. Okay. So you are irresponsible, you are worthless, you are a stone hearted, you are this, you are that. Oh, okay. No, I can say I am not stone hearted. So I, I remember just a few weeks ago, one person with whom I had spent a lot of time, give them a lot of attention and care, that person told me, you have no emotions. Now, my first reaction was so angry. I said, you know, I have been trying to be so sensitive to you, you have no emotions. But then it just struck me that just the previous evening I had gone for a program and I had spent some time talking with some person and that person told me after that, no, I have never felt so understood in my life. You just understood everything and you guide me so well. So then that thought came in my mind. I said, wait a minute, you know. It could be that I'm insensitive and of course I can learn sensitivity more also. But that person didn't feel like this. That person felt the opposite. This person is feeling like this. So then I thought maybe rather than taking it so personally, I said, maybe this person has some emotional needs that I have not fulfilled. Now whether I can fulfill that, whether it is my responsibility to fulfill that, or maybe it is somebody else to them to fulfill that, that is all later questions. But just that thought, that, you know, that rather than taking it personally, you have no emotions. I just managed, okay, is what? This person has emotional needs that I am not able to fulfill. So that frame of reference when I was able to put it in that, okay, I just took it a little more calmly. And then I connected them with another friend, and that friend, they are so grateful. You know, I said, I can't, I can't address this issue. But this person, friend is expert, you can talk with them. They talk with that person. They are so happy after that. So basically, what happens is, ins and inside every complaining adult is a crying infant. So if we are just addressing the complaining adult and the complaints of the adult, okay, it's like this, no, it's not like this, it's like this, it's like this. There is no end to it. Because the issue is not being addressed at all. So we have to try to understand their frame of reference. And if we spend some time, invest time in trying to understand the person, understand the frame of reference, one way to understand it is that if somebody we feel is making a big hue and cry about something, and we feel it's a very small thing, why are you making it so big? Then we could turn that question around and ask, you know, would I ever do something like this? I would never do something like this. For such a small thing, I would never do such a thing. Okay, not such a small thing. Is there anything in life that would make me behave like this? Now, if we look back at ourselves, we all can find times when we felt embarrassed, mortified about how we behaved. So, we can, okay, that situation, if, if somebody had done like this, I would have been mad at that person. So then, the way I feel, would feel about that situation, this person is feeling about this situation. See, in emotions, there is, we can't start with right and wrong emotions. We have to recognize emotions are what they are. And afterwards, they can be processed. But when the emotions come, we have to just understand, this is a very sensitive matter for this person. In their frame of reference, this is, this is high up. In their currency, this counts a lot. Now, whether it should count that much or not, that's a secondary question. But right now, it counts so much for them. So, if we at least begin with that understanding. So, when people, people, uh, often people don't want solution to their problems. And many times, they also understand this, this issue has no solution. But what they want is understanding. That at least you understand how serious a matter is this for me. So if we can at least say, so like I said earlier, that ask them. I understand this is very, uh, this is this matters a lot to you. Can you explain to me why it matters? They say, no. how can you not understand this? I, I'm trying to understand this. Can you please explain? Just be patient. Don't take their attacks personally. And then we start understanding their frame of reference, their currency. 
And even if they just become understood, they feel understood, a lot of the uh, emotional heat starts going down. They don't need a solution. They just need, of course, solutions may be needed. But first, what people need is understanding. So there are two simple ways in which each one of us can improve any relationship that we are working on. That is listening and appreciating. Listening means just listen to what the other person is saying. And appreciating doesn't mean, oh, you are such a nice person. Appreciating means appreciating their thoughts, appreciating their emotions. Not that they are good, but appreciation means, yes, I value this. Okay, this is how you are feeling. I understand it. We don't have to necessarily change anything about ourselves. Sometimes we can't change those things about ourselves. Sometimes they are about someone other than us. We can't change that. But if we just do these two things, listen and appreciate, we'll find that we will start understanding their language. We'll start understanding their currency. We'll start understanding their frame of reference. And then the connections will become much deeper. So this was the third point about the frame of reference. Any questions or comments about this? Any reflections? Yes, please. So everyone wants to understand in their way and listen and appreciate. I know myself, I am a solution for it. Like I listen and I, I'm listening and trying to find a solution. And some people it works, hmm. some people they don't feel appreciated that way because you didn't understand what I'm saying. I understood your emotions to this. It was this, this, and this. Do you want a solution or do you just want me to listen? How do you understand or what are some uh, references to make the other person understand that they have been listened to and that you appreciate them as they are? Okay, yeah, good question. So, we might listen and we might appreciate, but still the other person uh, may not want to move forward. We may want to give a solution, but they are still stuck with that itself. So, how can we say that listen, how can we make the other person feel listened, heard and appreciated? Uh, one way is to just rephrase briefly what they have said. So, you felt disappointed because I didn't come on time on that day. You felt angry because I forgot to get this. This is a simple example. But if I say you felt angry, no, I didn't feel angry. I felt hurt. Okay. So they might just rephrase it. So what happens? You just briefly rephrase what they have said. Most often what, what happens is that when we are speaking, when somebody is speaking to us, we are hearing not for understanding but for responding. Okay, you, know, you said this, this is wrong. I'll correct this fact. It's like sometimes our fact check is on. This fact is wrong, this fact is wrong, this fact is wrong. But okay, the facts are there and they need to be corrected if they're wrong. But understand the emotion. That's important. So rephrasing what they're saying itself is quite helpful. Um, rephrasing in our words. Another thing is that making an open-ended question, uh, how would you like me to help you? What do you think I can do to help you in this situation? So that forces them to think of the solution. Rather than we giving them a solution that they may not appreciate, but we ask them, what do you think I can do to help in this? So then, oh, maybe you can do this. Can you do this? No, no, this won't work. So what happens? If people are still thinking about the problem and we are giving the solution, again, it's like the connection is not happening. They're still in the problem-centered thing. So we have to gradually shift them. How do you think? How do you think I, I can help? Or what do you think you can do to fix this? Just ask them about that. So by asking questions, which shift the focus to the solutions. Then gradually, they, will, they may themselves come up, maybe I should not have done this, maybe I should do this. Or they may tell us, can you do this? And then we can tell whether we can or we should not. We can or we cannot. But it's, uh, it's, it's not easy. You know, there is nothing that we give 
in life as freely as advice. That is one charity with respect to which everyone is extremely charitable, <laughs> super charitable. So, but that is something which one aspect of learning to speak well is to learn when not to speak. So, the people have to, sometimes we may not have that time. If somebody wants to just be heard and we don't have that time, we just have to, we are, we are in a busy thing and we have to just fix it, fix it. We can tell you, you know, this, I can see this is a deep issue, can we talk about it later and we'll fix this time. And then if that's the need to be heard, then we allot them that time. So then, unless people are heard, they are still in the, in the problem mode only and they not come to the solution mode. So what happens if they not come to the solution mode, the solution just doesn't make sense to them. So they, they need to, it's when they feel understood, <coughs> okay now, okay, what can be done about this? Does that answer, answer your question? Thank you. And in understanding, they will feel appreciated. What other ways, other than understood, can you show appreciation to another person in their own currency? Yeah, how can we show appreciation for them in their currency? If we know their currency, then that helps a lot. Then some people, I mean, just, uh, you know, providing some small things for them. And we just provide them some nice food, just, uh, you know, maybe touch them softly or give them some words of appreciation for what they have done in the past. You know, that, that even if that particular issue, we may not appreciate what they have done, they have done something wrong. And you have gone through a lot and in the past you have weathered so many storms, you know, you, through the situation, how you went through it and handled it and came out. You are a fighter, you can deal with the situation, you are a survivor, you have strength with it. So we not, we not say that what you are doing is right, but you have gone through tough situations. And everybody has gone, the very fact that we are alive means we are survivors. There are so many difficulties which we all have faced in our lives. So you could appreciate that way. Yes, please. So I was uh, taught in a relationship management course okay. several years ago that, uh, and it kind of related with what you were saying, that behavior towards another person is a function of assumptions. So even before I know that person, the first sight of that person I make certain assumptions of that person in my mind. That's true. So, so you are speaking about something. So I already made assumptions about you yesterday when I saw you for the first time. Right or wrong. And therefore, my behavior towards you is a function of those assumptions. Now, if you do not know, uh, and I thought it related to that question that she had, uh, if you do not know what you think, what I think of you, then uh, that teamwork or that relationship hmm. may not proceed. So in other words, That's if you're true. saying something and I've already, I, somebody else has already told me that, oh, don't listen to this person, you know, constantly lies, then no matter how much sense you're speaking, it's not going to get in here. That's true, very true. Now we all make assumptions about others. So, so one exercise, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so that frame of reference that you were mentioning there, that frame of reference, uh, I think, changes from a home to office to a public place uh, or elsewhere. So if I know in each uh, setting, what the other person thinks about me. And I don't know how, but I don't know how you would know that unless there's communication. Uh, then, then that loneliness in the center. That can be dealt with, yes. yes. That's a very good point. We all make assumptions about each other. That's why one major principle in relationships is you know, talk with each other, not just talk about each other. 
oh, this person did like this to me, this person spoke like that, this spoke like that. What happens if A and B have some issues? Now, talking might be a little difficult because both of them have, have baggage. But if A is talking with C and B is talking with D, and then what happens is D tells a distorted version of that to C, and then C goes and tells back to A, oh, you know, this person said like this about you. It just makes things worse. So, we all have certain assumptions about each other and the psychologists call this as attribution error. Say if I like someone and I see them eating a lot, I say he must have been hungry. If I don't like someone, I see them eating a lot. Such a glutton. So, the action is the same. But for people's actions, we ascribe certain intentions. And the intention that we ascribe for that depends on our preconceptions, our assumptions. So, that's why a frame of reference means, as I rightly said that, how am I interpreting this person's actions or how is this person interpreting my action? So, I might be interpreting the action this way, I am attributing this action to this, but they are attributing this action to that. So, understanding our assumptions about each other is important and one way to do it is by just talking with each other. I'll just come back to you. Yeah, one minute. Many times we are told not to be judgmental, right? Because yeah. That's one thing that can come in the way of being more open-minded. Uh, so, are you saying that in terms of assumptions or, or it's general comment? In a, in a way, in a way, assumption is also judging, right? Yeah. See, we are told we should not be judgmental, that's true. But it's almost impossible to not be judgmental. There's a thin line between making judgments, which is essential, and being judgmental, which is undesirable. So, making judgments, and what is the main difference? Making judgments is situational. Being judgmental is personal. So, situational means, say, if we have something to be done, and that requires something to be done very promptly at a particular time, perfect, properly it has to be done and we know this person keeps forgetting. Mm -hmm. Then we can make a judgment call that this person is not the right person for doing this. But being judgmental means this person is irresponsible. So when we fix permanent labels on people, that is being judgmental. But if, if we think of not making judgment calls at all, then we won't be able to function in life. And so we do have to make call, judgment calls. But judgment calls can be based more on situation. Okay, this person may not be the right person for dealing with this issue. Hmm? And yes, because this person is, but we don't fix, we don't basically, see it's like, um, say, this is my opinion about someone. Now, if this opinion is here, I can have that opinion about that person, I can still see that person. Okay, this person is forgetful. But the closer and closer, closer and closer this comes to me. Now, if it's right around me, then I cannot see that person at all. I can see only the opinion about that person. So, we will make some judgment calls. Situational means that, that whatever judgment we have made, it is held at a distance. But when we are judgmental, that is held so close to us, we see that person only through that filter. We do not see them at all apart from that filter. So, we do need to make judgments. but we need, to, we need to be able to not fix that label permanently on that person and see that person only through that filter. That would be judgmental. Because okay. if we do that, then we will also be blocking out that person completely, right? Oh, yes. There is no room for relationship there. Exactly, yes. We reduce a person to a particular uh, deficiency that they have and that is all that we can think about about them, nothing more than that. Yes, thank you. Yeah? So, so uh, they, see, in order for us to practice that, they would make us uh, uh, write down on a whiteboard without arguing as to what <coughs> others thought about you. And we would write down all the words that came to their mind. So, if somebody, somebody would say that, 
uh, he's uh, sloppy, disorganized, lame, hmm. foul mouth. Uh, and from that would emerge a personality of who you are in that frame of reference. That's not necessarily who you are always. That's true. That's true. And so what we, uh, another way, I did, a, I did a retreat on loving exchanges on relationships in Sydney. So I did another exercise similarly, said that l who are the people with whom you have the most negative interactions? Make a list of three people like that and write down three good qualities of each one of them. And then once you write that down, when you interact with that person, Try to think about that good quality. So, in the in the Vedas, there is this old saying: "I says, let whenever you meet anyone, let your first thought about them be positive." It's not easy. I've tried it, and with some people with whom we have not much to do, it's easy. But for some people with whom we have had many tense interactions, to start with that first positive thought. It can make a big difference if you can do that exercise. If you can just let let my first thought about this person be positive. Just say, this person is also a spiritual being. This person is also a part of God. This person did this for me in the past. Whatever it is. So that can be very helpful in challenging our uh, preconceptions, or at least not letting the preconceptions dominate our interaction with them. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, at what point do we step away? See, we can help the unable, but we can't help the unwilling. So, now how do we differentiate? Say, suppose, maybe it doesn't happen so much in America, but suppose you are driving a car and the car doesn't start. Then what happens? You call some people, please push this car. And people are pushing the car from outside and the driver is also trying to move the steering wheel, move the gear. And together, the car starts moving. But suppose people are pushing the car from outside and the driver inside has gone to sleep. Now the people say, why should we push? Or worse still, the driver inside is pressing the brake. Then pushing is just of no use. So basically, there are some people who are unlikely to change or maybe we are unlikely to have much impact on changing them. Then we need to keep a distance from them. See what happens is different relationships work best at different distances. Sometimes we want to be very close to that person but that person is not interested in being close to us. You know, this, even physically this happens. Sometimes in different countries different levels of distance are considered to be like culturally appropriate. Sometimes it happens that two people are talking and the other one person just keeps moving closer and closer and the other person keeps moving backward, backward, backward. So they practically are moving around the whole house. Whole, you know. <laughs> so what is happening is that person thinks the same distance is this close but the other person will no, keep this distance, we'll talk. So we have to find out what at what distance the relationship works the best. Sometimes we may want them to be corrected, but they don't want to be corrected. Then we have to protect ourselves by creating some safe distance. That's required, yes. Okay. So let's move on to the last part now. So we are discussing the acronym CARE. So C-A-R. So we came back to ourselves and I accepted myself, then I tried to understand others' reference frame. Then the last is E is evolution. Evolution means Ultimately, we are meant to evolve in our consciousness by which we develop a relationship with the eternal, with God, with Krishna. The absolute can have different names in different traditions. But our most defining relationship is with the divine. We have two kinds of relationships, the vertical relationship and a horizontal relationship. The vertical relationship is with Krishna. 
and the horizontal relationship is with others. So our defining relationship, our eternal relationship is the vertical relationship. The other relationships are important, no doubt, but they are not necessarily permanent. Sometimes they may end before this life ends, or they may end at the end of this life. So the relationships that we have horizontally, each one of them is important, can be very important, but the pivot of our emotional life has to be the vertical relationship. So to the extent we are sheltered in our vertical relationship with Krishna, to that extent we can take the ups and downs in the horizontal relationships more maturely. If our whole sense of self-worth and emotional nourishment is coming only from one horizontal relationship and if something goes wrong in that, it will be like our whole world has come falling down. We won't be able to bear it. But if we are secure in our relationship with Krishna, then whatever ups and downs come, we'll be able to deal with it maturely. So broadly, in relationship, there's said to be three, three stages in relationships, you can say. There's dependence, there's independence, and there's interdependence. Dependence is unhealthy. That means, if one particular relationship is the sole defining relationship of my life, if somebody thinks that my defining identity is as a mother or as a father and then if my child starts going on the wrong track, then I don't just see that the child is on the wrong track, I think I am worthless as not just a mother or a father, but I am worthless as a human being. My life is a failure. Now of course we want our children to go on the right track, but they are also people with their own free will, we can't control them. So, if that relationship becomes our sole defining relationship, then we become dependent on that. And that is a very insecure position to be in. Now, from dependence, now independence, we can, we can ultimately never be totally independent. Even our physical existence, right now, we are breathing in air. We don't manufacture that air. So, we are always dependent. But there is in dependence on God, we experience independence. So the stronger our connection with God becomes, we become independent by that. And then when we have that security, yes, God always loves me. He always cares for me. He accepts me as I am. There is no, there is no wrongdoing, however grievous we may do, that will make God reject us. His love for us is always there. We don't have the power to do anything so bad that will make God reject us. He will always be with us. So that is, now this is not just a, some idea. Especially if we evolve in our consciousness, if we practice Bhakti Yoga, if we chant the holy names, we worship, we serve the Lord, we connect with Him through the practice of Bhakti, we experience that. And that security, once we have that independence through that, then we can move towards interdependence. Yes, I am a part of Krishna, Krishna accepts me. And for functioning in the world, I want to relate with others and we will function together. So we go towards interdependence, then if a particular relationship doesn't work, fine. I still have my relationship with Krishna, I will move on. And we will be able to function. So. Even in our horizontal relationships, we can function better if our vertical relationship is steady. I'll conclude with one example for this, and then we can have a few questions if there are any. I suppose somebody is working in a, in a big shopping mall, and in a, maybe in a big department store or whatever, it's a, it's a, say a cloth store. Now some customers, when they come go to see clothes, they want to see the whole store. They look at 500 dresses and they will not even take one after that. Now the attendant who is there, the attendant, what will happen to them is that they will feel, yeah, I know I have to pick up all this and put it all in place and such a big mess. Now, normally, whenever any customer comes into a shop, 
several attendants may go to that to attend to that person. But you know, some customers who are known to be very demanding, when they come, all the attendants go away. Nobody wants to deal with that person. So when such a thing happens, at that time, now if some if a customer is known to be a very very irritable, very uh, condescending, very dismissive, very demanding. Then, if an attendant goes and attends that person, and the attendant stays cordial, stays polite, and at the end of it, that person says, "You don't have what I want. I'm going." Now, the at attendant may feel I feel I wasted my time, but it's not necessarily a waste of time. If there is a camera and nearby there is a boss, and the boss is observing. And the boss comes, the boss also knows this customer is a tough customer. And the boss comes and then the boss says, hey, you are a cool guy. You know, you know how to handle tough customers. I will make you in charge of the whole wing and you train others how to handle tough customers. And if they can't, you handle them. So this customer, this, this attendant failed in making the sale. But still, the attendant succeeded in pleasing the boss. So similarly for us, for if we are spiritually minded, for us, every relationship is not just with the other person. It is for us, in every relationship, there is a third person. The third person is Krishna. So this person is doing like this, so I will do like this. If we, if we are simply retaliating, then where is the spirituality in our relationship? Now that doesn't mean we just take whatever the other person is any take whatever they are doing passively and let, let ourselves be trampled on. It just means that our our behavior is not simply a function of their behavior. Our behavior is a function of our principles, of our desire to evolve, our desire to please Krishna, our desire to love Krishna. So, okay, in this situation, what will please Krishna? How can I, how can I serve Krishna in this situation? So, if we think in this way, then we won't, we won't get carried away by it. Sometimes, some people, they are so nice and they are so kind and they inspire us to evolve. Oh, you are so kind, I want to become like you. So they encourage us by their positive examples. And some people, they force us to evolve. That means that they are placed in our life to help us grow more humble, more tolerant, more patient. And I was once giving a seminar on relationships. So once I, so I asked, asked, when we are practicing bhakti, there are many things which we need to tolerate. So what are the things? So one devotee raised his hand very enthusiastically. Yes? He says, we need to tolerate devotees. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, yes. That's a good realization. And as we advance, we will realize that devotees are tolerating us. <laughs> <laughs> so we do have to tolerate people. But it is not a one-way street that they are doing terrible things and we are tolerating them. We also have our conditioning and people are also tolerating us. So if you understand that in relationships, we are all, we are not here to see through each other. You are like this, you are like this, you are like this. We are here to see each other through. We are here to see each other through. If we think that this relationship is only for my pleasure, then I may start thinking, there is no pleasure in this relationship, why should I continue? This is a big difference in relationships that has happened in the last maybe 50 to 50 years or so. In the past, say people, people entered into marriage, they saw marriage as an obligation. Marriage is a commitment, marriage is a responsibility. But now people see marriage as an option. If it works, good. If it doesn't, forget it. So that sense of duty, that sense of responsibility is not there. So that's why it's not that people in the past did not have issues in their relationships. Everybody has their issues. 
I told you about his friend who was a marriage counselor. He said, I have seen only two kinds of couples. It's those who fight with each other and those whom I don't know very well. <laughs> so if two people are going to live together, there are going to be differences. You can't avoid them. But if there is this bigger purpose that I am meant to connect with God, I am meant to develop in my devotion to God. So this relationship is not just for our mutual pleasure. Of course, we, we don't want pain in the relationship. And if we can get pleasure, that's wonderful. But the primary purpose of the relationship is not just each other's pleasure. The primary purpose is to evolve in our consciousness, to go towards God, to develop ourselves spiritually. If we have that purpose of evolution, then the turbulence in the relationships will go down substantially. Or rather, we will be able to bear with that turbulence without overreacting to it. Without overreacting to it. And that's how this spiritual purpose that I am here to evolve in my vertical relationship. And my horizontal relationships, some relationships may encourage and inspire me to grow. Some relationships may compel me to grow. But both ways, if I am evolving, then I am on the right track. That way we will be able to deal with difficult people and persevere in difficult relationships without hyperventilating, without overreacting, without making things worse. So. One, one point which I'll conclude this is that never take permanent decisions based on temporary emotions. If you forget everything else from this class, just remember this one thing. Never take permanent decisions based on temporary emotions. Now, emotions come and emotions can be very, very volatile. We don't want to deny those emotions. We don't want to suppress those emotions. But if we take permanent decisions based on that, and we will, we will hurt ourselves, we will hurt others, and we will sentence ourselves to loneliness. We acknowledge the emotions, but no permanent decisions based on temporary emotions. In that way, we will tide over the storm of emotions and continue to a better, brighter phase in our relationships. So I'll summarize. I spoke on the topic of loneliness today. And <clears throat> I talked about how because of the breakdown of fam social structures such as families, a lot of people are experiencing loneliness. And how to deal with that? I talked about this acronym. What was it? Care. Care. C. So C was courage to trust. So I talked about how any relationship, if we are naive, we will be taken for a ride, we will be betrayed. But because of that betrayal, we may go to the other extreme and become cynical, thinking that everyone is bad. So in between these two is the courage to trust. Yes, there are, there are snakes inside me, there are snakes inside the other people, but let me take step by step. So trust can be reasonable if it is incremental, sensible and verifiable. And <clears throat> then I talked about second was, we came to, so we are talking about others, but before we can deal with others, we need to deal with ourselves. So I talked about A was, Acceptance. Acceptance has two, two extremes in which one is we don't accept any of our mistakes and the other is we don't accept ourselves only because of our mistakes. So to not, not accept our mistakes will prevent us from connecting with anyone else. Uh, we blame others only for everything that is wrong in our lives. But if we beat ourselves down because of our mistakes, thinking I am unloved and I am unlovable, that will, that will damage us much more. So we are our only resource. And if we don't accept ourselves, what do we have left with us? So we accept ourselves by, by having intrinsic self-worth. We want to achieve things, but our like parents, if they appreciate their children, not just for, what their, for their achievement, but for their commitment. Then their self-worth is not extrinsic, but intrinsic. And our intrinsic worth, self-worth comes from our spirituality. We are all parts of God. We are all sparks of divinity. And God loves us irrespective of whatever our limitations or defects may be. Then, once we have this basic acceptance of our mistakes and of ourselves, then when we are dealing with others, I talked about R was reference frame. Talked about how the same incident, a fan going off, I could escalate it to the level of the solar system or it could just be a switch over here. So, all of us, we have different frames of reference. And sometimes when people seem to behave in an 
incomprehensible way, they're making small things very big. That's just because their frame of reference is different. I talked about currency. So if somebody is complaining about something which we feel is very small, that means in their currency it is not a small thing. So to connect with the others, we have to understand their currency. And we understand it by looking at what if we do, they appreciate it a lot. What if we don't do, they complain a lot about it. And if you want to understand what, uh, why something, why are they taking such a small thing so big, we can ask them, you know, why does it matter so much? Can you explain why this is so important for you? So this non-judgmental question allows them to open. So even if we don't change anything, if we just listen and appreciate, listen and acknowledge, that will help them feel understood. And that can remove a lot, at least decrease the emotional temperature. Things can move forward. And last I talked about was E was evolution. At we, we have a higher vision of our life and our relationships. We are spiritual beings on a multi-life journey of spiritual evolution. And our relationships are not just for our mutual gratification. They are for our spiritual evolution. So just like an attendant may have a disagreeable customer, but the attendant stays polite in spite of the disagreeability of the customer because they want to please the boss. Similarly, if we see that our interactions are not just about us, we don't retaliate to the other person's behavior, but we think about Krishna and how can I serve Krishna, how can I please Krishna? What would Krishna want me to do in this situation? Then we can, uh, we won't react so emotionally. Inside every cry, complaining adult is a crying infant. If we try to understand them and address them, then we can tide over those storms. By connecting with Krishna, we become independent. And then when we form a relationship, we are interdependent. And then whether they work or not, we can still move on with steady here. And once we are independent, we have that inner security by which even if there are emotional highs and lows, we won't take permanent decisions based on temporary emotions. But rather, we'll move forward through the storms that are inev inevitable in relationships and move toward developing deeper, more meaningful relationships. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare. So it's a little, not little, quite a bit over time. So if there are any questions, maybe any of you can meet, we can meet personally and we can talk. So thank you very much for your coming today. Hare Krishna.